Okay, so we're talking about antibiotic resistance and crop production systems and the interface between animal and crop production systems. So the presentation outline, some general comments, and then some data. So people talk about AMR as an acronym for antimicrobial resistance. In the context of this talk, we're talking about antibiotic resistance. So we're talking about bacteria that are pathogenic, learning to be resistant to the drugs that we use to cure infections, as Lisa pointed out in her comments. So what you see on this slide is a timeline at the bottom going from the 1930s to more or less now. And you see a bunch of names of different classes of antibiotics and red arrows. The tail, so if we look at the top left-hand corner, we have the sulfonamide antibiotics that were amongst the first antibiotics brought to market. And the arrow next to the sulfonamides, the back end of the arrow represents the year at which those antibiotics were brought into the market. And the pointy end of the arrow represents the year at which resistance to that antibiotic was first detected. And so you could see that for every class of antibiotics that we brought to market within a handful of years to a few years, resistance is detected. And the concern is that the genes that, uh, that code for resistance to these antibiotics, if they accrue within a pathogen, so a pathogen becomes resistant to every antibiotic available, physicians will no longer have options to treat that infection, and that obviously would be very bad. So as we see antibiotic resistance developing, and as we move towards the potential catastrophe of losing uh, the efficacy of all of these drugs, uh, there are consequences. So there are increased healthcare costs because we need to move to more expensive drugs. People stay in hospital more. We see more people dying, mortality, more morbidity, more illness, longer time to cure disease. We've effectively reduced the shelf life of medicines and therefore there's less economic incentive for big pharma to bring new antibiotics to market. So that's not happening. And potentially we could return to the pre-antibiotic age where uh, for certain infections, we no longer have medicines that are effective. And of course, uh, that would be catastrophic with respect to costs and healthcare statistics. And there would be a loss of quality of life because we would lose medical procedures that are now thought routine, such as, for example, joint replacements, where you need to prophylactically, prophylactically treat a person to avoid fatal infections. So what does this have to do with agriculture? It's so agriculture is linked to people through what's been coined the One Health Framework, that through the environment and through the consumption of food, people uh, are exposed to microbiology that are shed by animals or that are carried in, in foodstuffs that we consume. So if we're, if we're feeding uh, livestock antibiotics and selecting for resistance in those production systems, that can come back to haunt us. And that's where agriculture fits in the bigger picture of managing antimicrobial resistance. And so within that context, uh, the focus of a lot of work that we've done here has to do with what gets applied on the land through manure. Uh, does that represent something that we need to worry about and how do we manage our way out of that? So if you look at the top left-hand corner of the slide, we're giving antibiotics to animals or poultry. Uh, selecting for resistance in those systems, being exposed to foodstuff. The waste from those systems are excreted in many production systems. It's confined for some period of time before being applied. Moving to the right of the slide, it's being applied on a ground. And that manure carries bacteria that have been selected for in those systems. And in many instances, the uh, drug residues that are excreted by those animals. We've been doing the same thing with sewage sludge, but we're not going to talk about that today. So our key research questions have been, uh, do these practices increase the abundance of antibiotic resistance genes in soils? And does that represent an increased like, likelihood that these genes will be transferred to crops that would be consumed by people or animals? And so the key underlying assumption in all of this that would is a concern is that an increase in gene above abundance above background represents a higher likelihood of human exposure to antimicrobial resistance and would therefore be considered to be of concern. And 
Thank you. So uh, bottom left hand corner. So we've done a lot of field work looking at how persistent bacteria and the genes that they carry are in these systems. Is it, are these things very persistent and therefore the window of concern is big or are they destroyed immediately and therefore really we don't need to worry about this. And we've been looking to the, the transfer of various things to crops. We've worked with manure from dairy systems, poultry, swine, and humans. And we've looked at a variety of different treatment options that were touched on, some of which were touched on in the previous talk. So these experiments are done uh, in uh, Ontario, in Canada, which is on the north shore of Lake Erie. The climate here is called a humid continental climate. And if you look at the world map in the bottom right-hand corner, the pink bits share that climate. So uh, the climate here would be shared in, in let's say, northeastern United States, uh, moving into Europe and eastern Europe, parts of Russia and parts of China. Uh, it certainly would not be shared, for example, in, in, in the south of Texas. Here's the scale of the field experiment. So you see a, a tanker applying dairy manure slurry on a field. And what we've generally done in these experiments is grow vegetables, root vegetables, and above ground vegetables through the growing season, harvest them in the fall when they would be considered suitable for consumption, clean them off like you would in, in your kitchen, and then recover the microbiology off the surface of those vegetables. And then we use a bunch of microbiology tricks to characterize those vegetables. So on the left-hand side with the green arrow, we use what are called culture-dependent methods. So plating things on agar, enumerating, isolating, characterizing. And on the right-hand side of this figure with the yellow arrow, we extract DNA from these preparations and we use a, a bunch of molecular tricks to quantify genes that we know are associated with antibiotic resistance, characterize genetically the organisms that are carrying those genes that sort of thing. And what I'm gonna focus on today are methods that characterize genes that are carried in the manures, trying to understand what happens post-application. And so the first data set that I'm gonna talk about uh, was published in 2014. Again, these kind of field scale experiments. And so I'm gonna you, show you three figures of data. And essentially the question that we asked here was if you move to the right of this slide, You'll see fall 2013. So we harvested vegetables in the fall of 2013 that had received from ground that had received manure in the spring of 2013. So the same season manure application is harvest. That was one experiment. Another experiment was we had applied manure to a different field plot in the fall of 2012. Again, commonly done, uh, common timing of manure application in the Great Lakes Basin, certainly and then looked at what we were recovering in the fall of 2013. So we're now looking at roughly a year between application and harvest. And a third scenario where we had applied the manure in the spring of 2012, so well before the harvest of vegetables in 2013. And again, we're trying to understand the window of persistence of these genes that we're applying with the manure. And so I'm going to show you uh, the, uh, the relative abundance of one gene called SOL1. In the top right hand, you'll see that acronym SOL1. So this is a gene which is associated with resistance to those sulfonamide antibiotics. So one of the first antibiotics that were brought to market, a very important class of antibiotics. And I should say that this represents a whole bunch of other data that we have that looks like this. So uh, this, this is representing a bunch of other data. So you'll see in the May of, 20, uh, of 2013, uh, the abundance of this gene goes up and it goes up through June following application of the manure, and then it goes down. But looking at November, you can still see a black bar there in the plots that receive manure, indicating that it's still above background, which is at detection limit in these experiments. So the in-season application resulted in an increase in abundance through harvest time in that year. So here we're looking at the fall application previously. So we're here we're looking at application in October. You can see the, the abundance of this thing shooting up, reference to control. We don't have any observations through December into May, June, because the ground's frozen solid. Looking into July, August, and November, you can still see it's increased in abundance relative to the control. 
So a 13 month uh, offset between application and harvest in this instant, instance in our climate didn't reduce it to background. And here we have the uh, application the previous spring. So we're now looking at 19 months. And so you can see uh, it goes down into October. We have the winter, the following growing season in November. Statistically, it's that background. So the take home message is under our climate conditions, one growing season with raw manure was not sufficient to reduce the abundance of antibiotic resistance gene to background. That's the take home message. So the second piece of data uh, also was published in, uh, in 2018 recently. So the question here was when we look at the increase in abundance in our field experiments, as we just saw, what portion of that is due to genes that are entrained in the manure, in the fecal material, and what portion is that gene in the background bacteria that Lisa spoke about that maybe just increased in abundance because we're feeding the soil and we know that bacteria increase in abundance? If it's the first instance, it might be of concern. If it's the second instance, it might be of less concern. So what we did is a field experiment looking at the dynamics of these things in plots that receive food waste compost that would not have any fecal material, yard waste compost that would not have any fecal material, and swine manure compost that would have fecal material. So the hypothesis would be if all of the genes were of fecal origin, in the third instance we would see an increase in abundance. If some portion or all of it was due to this bloom effect, we might see it in the first two instances. And this was a long-term experiment. These materials were applied in 1998, and we took soil samples and made observations in 99, 2001, 2003, 2009. So we're looking at roughly a decade of observation. Food waste compost, so the columns here are food waste compost at three different application rates yard waste compost, swine manure compost. These different designations, SUL1, STRA, et cetera, indicate that those genes are increased in abundance, reference to a control that doesn't receive these organic materials. And so you can see in the year following application, all of these organic materials increase the abundance of some genes, the swine manure compost, more genes, and you can see over time, the swine manure compost have those genes apparently more persistent. And one other piece of information from this experiment is that a kind of bacterium called Clostridium that produces very environmentally recalcitrant spores is increased in the plots receiving swine manure compost, but not in the other plots where BDL means below detection limit BQL means below the quantification limit. So swine in your compost that contains these clostridia, they are persistent for a decade following application. So a concern that we have now is that these spores that are carried in these fecal materials, these things are ubiquitous in, in fecal material, but also in soils. These organisms are anaerobic. Some of them are real bad and can cause bad infections and they all form spores that are incredibly recalcitrant in the environment. So the take home message is that some bacteria can persist in soils for years and may explain why the swine manure treatment had these genes uh, more persistent than the other materials. We're currently trying to determine if the clostridia are of manure origin or both. And that's where we are with this. And the final piece of data uh, is referencing uh, some of the treatment methods that we saw in the preceding talk and that we're gonna see in the next talk. So it's asking what pre-application treatments are effective at reducing loading rates of antibiotic resistance genes. And so what we did in this experiment was we did to farms, commercial farms that are near our research center, and we sourced four kinds of manure dairy farms. So on the left-hand side, we, had, we sourced raw manure, we sourced anaerobically digested manure. On the right-hand side, we sourced manure that had been mechanically dewatered and manure that had then been composted. So four different kinds of manure. We applied them in our field experiments and did the kinds of measurements that you just saw. And I'm not gonna show you data, but the conclusion is that of those four 
different kinds of manure, the composting option reduces the burden of, anti of antimicrobial resistance in the manure and reduces the likelihood of transfer of those genes to crops post-application. So in terms of general conclusions, genes associated with antibiotic resistance can persist in soil for multiple seasons following manure application, at least in our climate. I didn't show you this, but vegetables harvested in the year of manure will carry a larger burden of antibiotic resistance than vegetables grown without manure. And so that represents something that's not good. With a couple of options to get around that, you increase the offset time between manure application and growing crops, or you treat the manure prior to application to reduce the likelihood of transfer to crops. Finally, I just want to point out that the critical knowledge gap in this field is we don't understand the relationship between what you consume through either food or through an environmental matrix and an unwanted health consequence. So we can quantify things, we can characterize genes, we can characterize their genetic context. What we really don't understand is the relationship between what you would consume and, and, and an unwanted health consequence. So there's work that needs to be done on the hazard component of a, a risk assessment that would inform, let's say, policy or practice on the basis of evidence. And that's it. I'm done. 